Whether we know it or not, I think um, lots of people, particularly in Britain today, are engaged in this, quest this question of political theology. If you have been reading newspapers and been wondering what does it mean to be British and British identity, if you've wondered what does it mean to hold together British society around this phrase called community cohesion, then you're part and parcel of a serious international debate about religious identity and unity. How do we faithfully engage across traditions so that we actually have coherent societies? It's an issue for the church and its mission, and it's an issue for how we are understood, how we make sense to each other. There's a great story told by Rowan Williams, which I think um, encapsulates this issue of political theology. He tells a tale of a Romanian um, government minister under the Ceausescu regime, uh, Anna Parkour, um, a notorious government minister, and tells a story of her walking through Bucharest uh, uh, on a, a very sunny day with an umbrella. And this umbrella wasn't there to protect herself from the sun. And she was questioned by a passerby, why are you carrying an umbrella on this sunny day? Her reply was, because it's raining in Moscow. And it's a typically witty Rowan Williams story that highlights two big questions. Religious people bring to the fore something of elsewhere. There is a view from elsewhere that they bring to present realities. For Anna Parkour, it was Muscovite communism dictating how she should live in Bucharest. For Christians, it's the world of the Bible and Christ's lordship. The challenge of that story is actually how does our politics from elsewhere make coherent sense in the world today? For Anna Parkour, it was a parody. It was something that was ludicrous and nonsensical. For Christians, some of our politics can be done in a way that doesn't make sense. The question is, how much translation should we do? How do we stay faithful, but stay a community that can contribute to the wider good? This goes to the heart of political theology. I got into this whole area um, in a very practical ministerial context. Um, involved in Christian ministry, I'm a, an ordained parish priest in a Muslim majority area. What does it mean to be the church amongst a people where religion is political, where religion is very public? That's something that's integral to Muslim identity. And as I explored this, what does it mean to be a Christian and political? Because a key accusation to the Christian faith from Islam is that your religion is privatised. It's just a, a Sunday rite. I then began to explore some of the key moves in, at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, towards a political theology, a rediscovery of ecclesial politics. For me, it's an area that is not just live for the church, it's pressing, particularly for the Western church, where we're increasingly conscious of religious difference. We're in an age that's post-Christian, but it's not secular. Jürgen Habermas would describe Western culture, um, particularly Europe, as post-secular. Um, Christianity has been a dominant framework in a country like Britain. Secularisation and the secularisation thesis has had its day too, but actually the reality is there are religious groups asserting difference. And the big question is both how do we express ourselves in fully faithful ways across a community of difference, but secondly, how do we come together for the common good? Those are the two tensions that I see 
in that question of political theology. And it's brought me to explore this unusual political theorist, Carl Schmitt. Unusual and controversial because his ideas as a, a Nazi apologist um, actually are deeply repellent. But he's put his finger on some key thinking that resonates with a, a recovery of Augustinian political theology, a traditioned political theology that seeks to explore politics from within a framework of Christian mission and salvation history. I'd, I'd like to introduce you to an infamous German political theorist of the 20th century, Carl Schmitt, as a springboard to talking about the discipline of political theology. Schmitt was a professor at the University of Berlin during the Nazi period and an outspoken apologist for National Socialism. His philosophy of law and the character of the state provided an ideological underpinning to Nazism and anti-Semitism. It seems strange to consider Schmitt's ideas with all their deeply repellent connotations for a timeline series on theology, but his thinking has generated conversations that continue to this day amongst political theorists and theologians that have energy even into the 21st century. It is some of Schmitt's core ideas and questions and how they resonate with a wave of specifically political theologians that I shall be attending to. Schmidt has been described as the German Hobbes of the 20th century. So Thomas Hobbes, who wrote the classic Leviathan, the first textbook of modern political theory during the 17th century, was looking to give an account of a strong state that could hold together, as he saw it, the warring tendencies of a chaotic humanity. Hobbes is probably best known in the popular imagination for the quote from his book Leviathan that life in its natural state is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Schmidt was building on this very pessimistic view of the world from some explicitly theological roots out of his Roman Catholic upbringing about sin and the consequences of sin for the division between peoples. He outlined his theories with allusions to the enmity between woman and the serpent in Genesis and the Tower of Babel. The purpose of the political then for Schmidt is to provide a locus for unity, balanced with a clear sense of who the state is against as a buttress to that unity. This is what he calls the freund feint distinction, the friend or foe approach to politics. In the same way that Hobbes was attempting to address questions like what gives legitimacy to government and binds us together in the aftermath of the English Civil War, so Schmidt was engaging with similar questions for a debt-ravaged Germany dealing with the settlement of the League of Nations after the First World War. The theolo theological impulse of Schmidt's thinking was essentially a critique of modern liberalism difference between groups could not be obscured and the false unities of a League of Nations would only lead to chaos. Liberalism aspired to neutrality and optimism and was thus inherently theological because it espoused a myth of perpetual peace in contradiction to the Christian anthropology of sin. Difference needed to be acknowledged and affirmed, and alliances fostered only in the heightening of who the other, the enemy, were. It's not difficult to see then how this political theory could become a theoretical basis for the scapegoating and persecution of Jews in Nazi Germany. In Schmidt's analysis, the true state takes on theological character when it admits judgment outside the rule of law. This is what he describes as the state of exception. This power is the true mark of the sovereign, of deciding a matter outside any mechanism of accountability. The state of exception is therefore the rationale for totalitarianism. What this state of exception does is to admit that the state is always making judgments about what is right and wrong and that secular liberalism is an insufficient warrant to that power of judgment. Schmidt's most famous dictum that I hope explains this point is the following. All significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularised theological concepts. 
What he is doing is arguing for the inherently religious or transcendent nature of governmental rule. The judgment of law cannot but stand outside the will of the people. Democracy and liberalism presume an objectivity and an optimism that can never be attained and fails the realities of selfish individuals. So what's this got to do with Christian theology? What is it about some of these deeply unpleasant beliefs that warrant serious consideration by political theorists and theologians alike? Well, the first point, and perhaps the most obvious, is in that phrase, political theology, that Schmidt reclaimed. It will be necessary to go right back to St Augustine of Hippo to begin to draw the connections that make Schmidt such a significant conversation partner. Political theology is a phrase that has its origins in the philosophies of the classical Greek city-states, the polis of the common good that we see in the writings of Aristotle. These ideas flowed through into the Stoic philosophies of Rome, who distinguished the gods of the city from other gods and theologies. It is this thinking about the theological nature of the city that provides the counterpoint to Augustine's seminal treatise, The City of God, at the beginning of the 5th century. Augustine's classical political theology articulates the doctrine of the two. The idea that there are two cities, the city of God, ruled by love of God, and the city of man, the earthly city, ruled by love of self, and therefore having the need for coercion. The city of God is eternal, and the city of man is mortal. The key concept that Augustine describes for the purpose of political